Hey folks, Master Coex here. This story has been on the back burner for a while now, and it's to do with the idea regarding Gine training. But not on Earth or anything like that. No, not like that other story. But this time alongside Bardock as part of his squad. Now, I believe that somewhere it was mentioned that she used to be part of his mercenary band, but then her woeful battle power saw her being consigned to preparing meat in the Saiyan kitchens to which Bardock would often visit her after missions. In this story though, we ran with this narrative plot point, and instead of Gine giving up on a lot through peer pressure, Bardock would run with the idea of having her around and keeping her place a lot more concrete in the team, which would lead to massive gains besting Seripa, ending Nappa through some bizarre altercations on another world, and of course changing the course of Dragon Ball's history and Super's progression of the Granola arc. In the last part, Gine plays a pivotal role, intercepting Elect's assault on the Cerulians and countering his sneaky tactics, resulting in a surprising standoff that is able to showcase the Saiyans' unexpected compassion. Her son Raditz's safety becomes a major concern with the potential involvement of Frieza later on if things go south for the heaters, but she then secures the situation by capturing Alec. As Bardock battles Gas like he does in the original, the silent but formidable heater, Gine discovers the potential of the Cerulean Dragon Balls and the Dragon Torombo through Manaito. The encounter escalates, Bardock ultimately defeating Gas, of course, and Elec in a demonstration of raw power and tactical prowess. Though not without sustaining an injury or two, of course he's not super strong. Their victory inadvertently sets the stage for political chaos in the sector, as their actions could incite Frieza's wrath or create a power vacuum within the heater network's downfall. Unbeknownst to Bardock though, Gine have concocted a secretive plan with Muesli. After their departure, the Cerulians leverage their own Dragon Balls, mysteriously repopulating and erasing their planet from galactic charts. The planet no longer there in that sector of space, baffling even Frieza, who, through Zarbon and Dodoria, learns of the titanic power shift and plans to capitalize instead on the Heater's demise instead of the Cerulean's. But now we must resume to see where things go from here for the next few weeks. The situation around planet Vegeta was surreal. Sure, the Saiyans were some of Frieza's most useful fighters and mercenaries, but in the matter regarding the heaters and the acquisition of their land and space and money after their supposed disappearance alongside Planet Serial, the Saiyans' service were not really required. They were greatly minimized from expectations. The only Saiyans involved were those already out on existing low priority missions who were then told to report to Freezer headquarters, changing directive, and then head off to Heater Space. The rest of the Saiyans, though, were told to hold the fort on their own home planet and await further instructions. Well, there were no instructions coming. Usually, the Freezer Force were constantly barraging the planet with requests for work, but that had all but dried up, and the oversight around the planet from the tyrant to keep them in check had also dried up, their resources being required in heater space. And King Vegeta wasn't thrilled about this, not one bit. In his eyes, his very paranoid eyes, the Saiyans were being frozen out of a very lucrative pie. The heater zone had been a very interesting prospect to the Freezer organization, and King Vegeta's intel what little he had, had information that gaining that land and the potential it had could yield benefits for all. But for now, Lord Freezer was looking to scoff the lot, scoop the entire widget, none for his loyal factions and subordinates. Bardock, who was privy to these discussions as part of King Vegeta's royal command, was loving every single expletive to come out of the king's mouth. Oh, he was angry. It also meant that he was busy fixated on something else rather than his own men. He probably could say whatever he wanted. And he had a plan. Sire, said Bardock one day when the king was extra grumpy. What is it, Bardock? What do you want? I am busy with important regal affairs. Bardock held his tongue. He would normally, at this point, throw a barb or two in the monarch's direction. But this time, 
he chose to remain silent on that front. Sire, might I request something? It might be of interest to you. Bizarrely, the king turned around and gave him a quizzical expression. No witty banter. No sarcastic remarks. It must be serious. Speak. Bardock then walked forward, causing mutters from the king's mooks. Abby spoke. As you know, I am more than capable of taking my squad into unusual situations. Alien to most. Get to the point, Bardock. You don't need to humor me with context. I already know what you and your team can do. Bardock nodded. Of course, sire. I wish to take my squad into the heater zone and gather intel from the source as to what Frieza is up to. Maybe we can get the jump on him, get a source in there, a mole. We might be able to even establish a connection of our own, keeping us in the loop about the Emperor's movements. King Vegeta eyed his servant up with intrigue. Wouldn't that arouse suspicion and accusations of treason from Frieza? Well, possibly, said Bardock with honesty. You're not making a good case. But what option do we have, sire? The longer we're in the dark, the more on the back foot we will be when Frieza does darken our doorstep once more. How much information will we know? None! If we at least have some clue as to what's going down out there, the transactions that unfold, we might be able to get a foothold in heater space of our own. We might otherwise miss out on. Because quite clearly, Frieza is not letting us in. He could tell the king wasn't fully sold on this. So then he had another idea. All the races he borrows with. Races that might be even stronger than us. What? Stronger? We Saiyans are the strongest warriors around. Who could possibly be stronger? That's the point, sire. We do not know. And if you do want to know, figure out what could be fighting for our own superiority within the Force, allow us to find out. That way, we won't be left behind. The lackeys muttered again with compelled tones, the king looking to them, whispering in conference. After a few minutes of this, the king then turned back to Bardock, resuming his stoic default expression. Very well, Bardock. You may proceed. Take your team to the heater zone and report back frequently. Do you understand? Nobody outside this room and your team must know what we are doing, or else we risk this fragile detente we find ourselves in. Bardock once again nodded and left the room. A scout mission to the heater zone, said the squad and Toma with trepidation. What do you hope to gain from this, Bardock? said Toma. Hey, come on. I got you guys a job. It's been dead around here. Would you rather kick back and do nothing for the billionth time on this hellhole? Well, I wouldn't. So, why can't you just be grateful, would you? Serapa was confused by this mission. You're not usually this passionate about a job, Bardock. What gives? Gine looked at her and scowled. Didn't you hear? We've got work. Not being paid is kind of a bad thing, you know, as we, well, need to eat. And Bardock and I have a family to provide for. Serifa scowled back. As you can tell from the story, she hated Gine. She knew she couldn't do anything to lash out either, but, oh, she wished she could. Toma then pondered on this for a while. I suppose. It's better than nothing. Yeah, I'm game for some excitement, shouted Pambukin, keen for a fight. The team slowly came around to the idea, then planned to head out in two days' time. But before they left, Bardock had one more thing. Oh yeah, I'm gonna bring Radis along. Thought he could get a chance to try out his first mission before he starts his own training up. Totipo and Toma were surprised, to say the least. Raditz? Really? said Totipo. I thought he was a weakling. You sure about this, Bardock? He could get hurt. Bardock brushed that aside. It wasn't a concern. <laughs> Please, we're just going on an exploration mission. No combat. Even Radis couldn't get hurt in one of those. That elicited a laugh or two from the male members of the team. And with that assurance, they soon filed out without question and were ready to get going. Curious to see how Raditz would fare or not fare. Selipa, though? was still skeptical. She hung back as the rest of the group filtered off to get ready. What's your plan, Bardock? She said without right suspicion, with her feeling that something wasn't right. Gine was about to retort, but Bardock told her to go home and tend to Raditz. This would be settled on their own. Then Bardock looked to Seripa with a weary gaze. Would you get off my back, Seripa? 
What's your problem? Serapis stepped forward and leered at her captain, not buying the story. You're clearly up to something. Bringing your brat on a mission? Don't make me laugh. A scout mission for the good of the king to boot? You never do missions like this. Since when did you care about making him happy? All we've done is lie through our teeth around him. What makes this any different? For all I know, this could be yet another excuse to pull the wool over our eyes. Who's gonna die next? Bottom clenched his fist. We said we would never speak of that again. What do you want to happen, huh? Be thrown in jail for treason? Or be thrown to the Galactic Patrol as a bargaining chip? At least with my going about things, we can retain our freedom and good grace. Why you gotta question these opportunities? Just take them. Serapa looked away with annoyance. Well, okay, truth be told, he had a point. If the king found out that Nappa had died on their watch at this point in time, and she was unable to stop it or didn't report it when it happened, she would be in major trouble. It was too late to snitch. She had to keep it to herself. The man she loved, his fate, had to lose itself to time. And that disgusted her. All she could do was turn away, walk out, saying only one more sentence, which reverberated around the chamber. I'll be watching you. She slammed the door, and Bardock was left alone with his thoughts. Bardock, you can't gold her. We can't risk her becoming a loose cannon, said Gine later, as she then put Raditz to bed. Would you relax? I got this under control. We'll finally have a chance to be free. Can't you see it? Heater space is mostly uncharted wilderness from this side of the divide. Plenty of area to get lost in. Lost? Who will get lost? Her eyes then flashed. That's your plan, isn't it? To escape? Bardock silently nodded. And abandon our squad? Leave them to God knows what out there? Endanger their lives in the unknown? Yes, of course, the plan had some drawbacks. This could incur a level of danger and peril for his squad, but in his mind, he had no other option. Gine, we have to do this. If we don't do this now, while Freezer is looking the other way, our family will never be free. Gine was confused. I don't understand. Why are you being this considerate toward your family? You've never been this forward thinking. What's changed? Bardock stepped back and sighed. Look, ever since you started training, being part of my world, doing this for me and our family, to protect us, it made me remind myself as to why I fell for you. You didn't give up. Not on yourself. Not on me. Not on Raditz. You did yourself proud, kid. And that's something I find incredibly captivating. So, it's time for me to step up and do what I can for us, our family, our blood. Gine was floored by this mission. It was so eloquent for him. Well... I was going to tell you eventually, but our family may be growing soon. Bardock was shocked, to say the least. He was going to be a father for a second time? Well, he looked even more determined. Then all the more reason to get out of this dump. The plan became clear for Gine. On their way to the heater zone, and once they passed the border, Bardock's pod with Raditz in it would malfunction, be sent careening into a nearby planetoid. Bardock would do the research as best as he can and find a potential candidate. Gine would follow in pursuit, but lose communication with Toma, and their transponder units would be deliberately exposed in the craft, which of course could be then severed to avoid detection. But what about Seripa? She's not gonna buy this! Bardock shook his head. Don't worry, I got a plan for her. That's why Radis will be piloting with me. She's always thought him to be a loser and an airhead. She knew I would fake something if I was just on my own, but the boy? Him there? That variable? She knows he's no warrior. <laughs> Gine didn't take too kindly to that remark. I understand what you're doing, Bardock. She stepped forward and slapped him hard. But don't you dare talk about your own son in that manner. He's your own flesh and blood as well as mine. If you insult him, you insult me. I will not hear another word against him from you. Do you understand? or else you can go off on your own! Bardock was stunned. I'm sorry, Gine, I... I got carried away. I promise. It's just that... I just wish that... Raditz would... Besides, if we're going to abandon our people like this, 
What does it matter if he's not the strongest Saiyan warrior? What would matter is that he was free. That we would be free. You've got to change your priorities, Bardock. Bardock then hugged her tightly. Guard your heart when you're mad. Kine was flummoxed by this and laughed out of confusion. Bardock, now's not the time for that sort of thing. I'm serious. If you're serious about this, then you need to reprioritize yourself. With that, Bardock did so, and the pair readied their plan. As they entered the heater zone, when the maps would go dark, the group were very interested in finding out what they were going to find out there. They had only one waypoint to go to, the rest completely unknown. Seripa was leading the line of pods, Bardock having granted her the head of the snake, as she'd been rarely granted this position, so she absolutely loved this and eased her suspicion for the moment. The crew were also curious to see how Raditz would behave on this mission, whether he could be a future squad member if Bardock retired or they needed an extra pair of hands, when he had done his time on an alien world and come back, subjugating it for Lord Freezer, of course. They silently thought that maybe it should have been one of the weaker planets. But, oh no! Emergency buzzers were going off like crazy as Bardock's pods suddenly went haywire for no specific reason. The communications were then being interrupted by bangs and blast from charges that they had brought instead of the ship itself. Oh, damn it, Raditz! I told you not to touch anything! But Papa, I, I didn't touch anything! Raditz was in the dark, by the way. Of course you would say that, you... <laughs> Stupid Bardock. I knew his brat was a new good beatnik. She whipped around the pod to see what was going on with Bardock's craft, but said craft had sustained what looked like substantial visual damage. By the way, those were more charges planted on the pod, which were more like flashbangs and dirtied the pod but left no actual damage. In one swift move, Bardock's pod violently pitched downward to a nearby planet at great speed. Gine, understandably, followed as backup. Toma was shocked. Seripa, we have to follow them. Help Bardock out. He could be, hold it. I'm in charge of this leg of the mission. And I say we waited out. I am gonna get embroiled in a family spat. But a Seripa, said Pumpkin. This is the middle of space. If if Parok's pod goes bang, well that's him a goner. Seripa chose not to reply. Good, she thought. If Bardock's kid got him snuffed out, then Gine would be in no condition to fight. If she survived, she would quit. She might do something even worse. But she kept that part to herself. Just wait. Well, they did wait, and wait, and wait. Then things got serious as the pods disappeared over the horizon of the planet and the transponders cut out. Now was the time to get worried, and they were too far to do anything. Seripa, what have you done? Thomas said with vitriol. We've lost contact! Totepa was equally incensed. You let them die! We don't know that planetoid, even if you couldn't survive and breathe on it. The sector of space is alien to us. Seripa held firm. There's nothing we can do. Gine's pod looked all right. Maybe her pod might be fine to report back. Let's keep going. King Vegeta will be mad if we turn back now, Toma replied angrily. This is payback for Napper, isn't it? Isn't it? Shut up! Bardock left me in charge, and I order you to shut your mouth. We continue. And so they did. Bardock's last command was to put her in charge, and uh, it would be taken seriously, albeit grudgingly. And with that, the three remaining pods pressed on, and the fate of the two pods supposedly locked in a death spiral towards the planet remained in doubt. But that's where we're going to be leaving things for right now.